All right. What is going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Brass Tack Bodybuilding. And I am joined today by Dr. Umar. This is somebody I've been working with for quite a bit here since post show. Um, how's it going, man? I'm good, man. Just, you know, another day. It was an off day, but I've just been here all day. <laughs> yeah. So Umar is uh, the owner of Asylum Sports Clinic, right? Yep. Sports. It's on legal terms, sports performance and recovery, but on Instagram, it's Asylum Sports Clinic. Mm -hmm. so real quick let's just do a breakdown of exactly what you do for the people who don't know because you are technically a chiropractor right but you do a lot more than actual just chiropractic stuff yeah i definitely practice a little bit more non-traditionally where traditional chiropractic is very joint manipulation and that's usually about it maybe a little bit of stim here and there but um i definitely like i enjoy the rehab side of chiropractic um a very small portion taught in school and i think that's why people don't go in that route more and then I also practice heavily with the manual therapy um, combined. I do all the other chiropractic stuff in there, but that's really not my marketing style. I just want people to know that I can get them some form of answer, whether it's to another person or to the right place. And that's kind of where we're at, you know, with things like that. So are you, you're not technically a physical therapist, but you do like physical yeah. therapy. Yeah. So we do go through a rehab portion in school. And then most of it after that is what we learn outside of school. And I, and I just realized when I came out that that's where that's the direction I like taking things more so than like, just, you know, manipulate and go. It's just not my taste. Mm -hmm. And you've been working with Nick a lot recently since he's back home in Jersey. Yeah. Nick, uh, Nick was actually here today. I've been working with him for, I'll be working with him all the way up to the show and we'll see how close we can get to the show. You did a podcast with him? Yeah, we did a podcast today. We filled him today. I filled the well, He came. I was like, "Yo, can I get a little bit of time before your session today?" And he was like, "Yeah, dude, of course." And we just kind of just sat down, just talked about everything going on in his life right now. That's cool. There you yeah. go. So, is Nick? Uh, obviously, me, but I'm not on Nick's level. How how much experience do you have with bodybuilders? Because I know that's like the the direction that you kind of are leaning towards is athletes, right? So, how did you get? started in that aspect of working with athletes over the general population because you yeah. and i both know that finding somebody that does what you do is very few and far between somebody who actually knows how to work with athletes and there seems to be a significant difference in the chiropractor or physical therapist <clears throat> in their ability to actually get shit done with a more advanced athlete compared to the general population yeah i think um the first thing is that like the fundamentals are always the same so like educationally everyone's always getting the same education never want to rule anybody out but for me, uh, I always, one, loved bodybuilding when I was a kid. I mean, I loved bodybuilding when I was, I'd say about fifth grade, it kind of started and sixth grade got my first barbell. So the love for that sport was always there. And a lot of people like, I don't look like a bodybuilder, especially following my like injury two years ago to my back kind of set me off. So a lot of people get surprised when I tell them like, yo, I've loved the sport since I was a kid um love the sport the history of it everything everything that goes into it the dedication so i knew some way shape or form i was going to go ahead and work with athletes and i always liked teaching people how to train that started very early on also so my career kind of molded and i wanted to know how i could step all those pieces together and this is kind of what came out of that originally i was going to go to school for dentistry that was the goal a, a dentist, dentist. Yeah, uh, that was my original route. And it wasn't until <clears throat> I actually had a pretty bad injury. And one of my buddies sitting over there right now actually introduced me to this world of chiropractic. And I'm not one of those believers of this is the cure for anything by any means. I'm actually very much so on the other side of it. Um, but one of my buddies was like, let's go here because my injury happened pretty severely. I dropped about, I think I squatted, I was squatting 405. My leg just gave out. And I started having such severe, severe pain. And I wasn't the type that really went down like medical. I always dealt with pain kind of on my own, very similar to you in a way, kind of just gritting it out. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to a chiropractor, went to a couple. It was cool. It was like an interesting experience, especially when you're not knowledgeable about it. You just think it's just like, oh my God, amazing thing. When in reality, it's very simple. But it was the way that one of them had communicated to me. He's a former power lifter, very like renowned and known. And he got me into the world and just communicated things with me in ways that other doctors weren't. I was seeing specialists. I was getting injections in my low back. Like my pain was so severe. I couldn't walk. I started selling my equipment and I was like, I think my lifting career is basically over and talking to him a couple of times, like just changed my mentality on things. I'm like, Oh, that was cool. Like not so much the treatment, but it was the interaction and getting the answers. That was so helpful for me. 
then I did eventually find my way back to lifting. Um, and then that led me from undergrad, led me to kind of chiropractic. And I was like, how can I get my fast track to where I need to get to? I guess in a way it would have been PT. Um, PT school could have also been an option, but it just really didn't come to my head because I didn't have an interaction with the PT that did that for me. So I just think that interaction set me on this path. And now I'd say I'm about, so I graduated 2021. But you know, about 2018, 2019 is when I started getting my foot step into this world, just by taking the knowledge that I had and working with people and networking and working for free and just getting experience and started working with local guys and then just got in with a really good group of people and they kind of networked for me. Um, and then it ended up leading to Nick. I actually just reached out to Nick on a whim one day. It was like when he had 900K followers and I was like, 900K, hey, okay. how many does yeah. he have now? What the fuck? Well, he's like, well, I think he's like, like 1.5. So oh, I didn't even realize that I never even thought it was going to be a thing. I never thought he was going to respond. You know, when you're messaging somebody that has 900 K, you're probably thinking like my message is going to get overlooked. Yeah. But he ended up responding. And the very first thing he said to me was, um, you're not one of those weird dudes, are you? <laughs> and I was <laughs> like, I was like, no. So I sent him like references and he got back to me and he was super cool. We started interacting. That was right after his rookie year um, that he had won Arnold in New York. Okay. That was like when I first started like really working with him. And that was really cool because I was seeing one of the craziest dudes coming off of a, one of the craziest rookie years in history. Yeah. So that was super cool to see that side of him. I don't, I won't go into like in detail, obviously for pri his privacy and respect to him, but like he had opened up a good amount in that like session. And I was like, damn, like that's not the type of interaction that I was expecting coming from the mutant. Mm -hmm. Like he gave me such a humane version of him and i guess that was kind of cool because you don't get to see that on social media um but yeah now we're working a couple times a week getting ready for new york pro in 10 weeks that's awesome yeah, yeah. no nick is a nick's a great guy he's very very it's weird to say he's humble because nobody sees him that way but he, he yeah. is he kind of is he's a uh, very down to earth he is i think when people see him on stage because like his stage presence is like he's in it like he's so in it he's always making those faces and getting into it so people mm -hmm. are like Oh, this, this dude's got to be so arrogant but like in here like he's just literally like i'm just a dude that lifts you know he'll literally text me it's like he'll be like hey how are you doing and i'm like it's it's just like it's funny because it's like i'm nobody in the world of bodybuilding and like this guy's just texting hey how, how are you like it's a cool guy you know oh for sure dude when he does that he'll he'll ask me like how's your like when somebody asks me like how's your mental like he won't just ask me like how are you where somebody could just be like oh i'm good how about you like he, he'll literally be like how's your mental and i'm like yeah. that's when you know like no one's just asking you that yeah no he's cool but what i really want to go over here with you today is all the different what would you what do you call them it was like with the technical term for the different modalities thing, modalities i guess right the different yeah. modalities their uses whether or not you think they are entirely legitimate or sure. scams which i know your what your answer is but just for the the general population of people that are watching this because my the demographic the large percentage of people watching this are like the younger kids getting into bodybuilding and that was the whole point of me starting this podcast is to introduce them to people that are more knowledgeable rather than just the fucking tiktok creators that they're limited to and yeah. having them expand their horizons beyond that and uh, i don't think like deep tissue work all that stuff is really talked about enough a lot of yeah. guys overlook it and I obviously think, I think it's very important. I think it has a place, but coming from somebody who actually does it, uh, I want to, you know, get your perspective on everything, all the different modalities and what you think their uses are. So I guess we could really just start with chiropractic, right? Your main bread and butter, which you went to school for. And uh, chiropractic gets a lot of, a lot of shit. It gets a lot of hate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they say, you're not real doctors. I don't know why people say that. They, for sure. But yeah, what is your, let's start with that. Let's start with that. No, for sure. I think it's so interesting when people go at it at that. I think from an educational standpoint, like we we're pretty level headed and we're pretty level with like a lot of other doctors, um, whether it's like DPTs or even I think the argument to a lot for a lot of people is that it's not med school. But even for other certain doctoral programs, like you don't go to med school and they're still referred to as doctors. Like that's just how it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is typically an eight year long program. So like even like studies wise, credits wise, hours wise, when you compare them, they are there from an educational level. And when you're recognized legally by the state, you know, I, I'd assume you'd get that respect. Like it's like that is the law. But people are like, no, my opinion means more than the law. So that's always an interesting. Um, yeah. But like you're just arguing like stupid stuff there. And don't get me wrong. There's parts about Cairo school that like were 
oof, like so far over where I was like, that is not like I loved the science part of chiro school, the actual anatomies, the biologies, the chemistries. That part was actually awesome. Even the neuroscience was awesome because that stuff is the same all around. Mm, yeah. So when you learn the basics there and then understand whether it's rehab, um, passive uh, modalities or an active modalities, whatever it is, and you can combine it all. And whether you have a sports background or some form of athletic background, you can, and you can put it together, you can get people to amazing places, just like occupational therapists and just like physical therapists. Granted, like it is a different title, but it is what it is. Now, what it's all based around is spinal manipulation, obviously the bread and butter. I don't think it's really all that. Do I think there is temporary forms of relief with it? Yeah. And the studies are really like, eh, but there's some things you see in person. You're like, wow, like that, like, is that really doing that for that person? And maybe it's just a form of self-belief because they do say like placebo is huge. Um, and maybe it's, maybe it's doing something that we don't understand, but do I use it in certain cases? Yeah. And for, do I believe like it's necessary? Typically no, it's really just temporary short-term range of motion. And there's no such thing as making it last. That's just another way of saying, let's reinforce it with other exercises to help you understand that this range of motion is accessible on my own, right? That's where the active portion of rehab essentially comes in and what physical therapy is all based around. Um, you see more and more chiros now going down that route because they don't believe in the philosophy of spinal manipulation is going to be the cure or the end all be all, uh, especially the far fetched stuff that was marketed in the beginning about like allergies and diseases. And you're just like, how are these people like mm -hmm. believing this? Like I had philosophy classes in school and some of these stories were just so wild that you're, you just couldn't believe that you were sitting there paying for it. I'm like, you know, like dissecting human bodies was worth it, but this is not so much worth it but you kind of just gotta grit your teeth get your paper and just get out of there and certain and that's just the honest truth for me personally some other people buy into stuff but that's I where go ahead i i think i was gonna say well I, I didn't fucking go to school but from what i've seen from the majority of you know anything that's related to physiology exercise science a lot of the things that are taught for the uh, for the most part what i see is a lot of outdated information still yeah it's a lot of old beliefs like i remember i had a chiropractor that told me you know ice always ice you want to reduce inflammation and i was like why why would i want to reduce inflammation isn't that part of the recovery process I was, no that's not how it works as like, what yeah. the fuck are you talking about <laughs> well it's crazy because the dude who made the statement redacted the statement years ago so you would have thought that everybody would have picked up on it but honestly you still hear medical doctors in hospitals or urgent care is telling people to ice things i'm just like where are you like where are you coming from is there not updated are you not updated on current you know so it's not just mm -hmm. like Kairos, which obviously are very outdated. It's all people. It's a lot of docs across all boards. I hear it from PTs. I hear it from MDs. It's just icing is just the most assumed form of let's treat the swelling with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of uh, I'd, I'd say a lot of the rehab uh, pain therapies of the world uh, doctors is very outdated, and there should be more research done into it. And there is a lot of research being put into it. It's just so hard to get the results that we're looking for yeah so in your opinion what do you think really is for spinal manipulation specifically like the back cracking or distraction flexion what purpose does that have for let's say for an athlete for a bodybuilder for an athlete like i said if we can gain short-term increases in range of motion and have the body understand meaning like have that perception that, okay, this is okay, or this is safe, or I can get to this range pretty easily, then we want to reinforce those things with certain movements and movement patterns and certain active ranges of motions. So that's really the only way I'd see it very implemented, or even post certain injuries in where the body does lose range of motion, because that is one of the most common symptoms of post-injury or even post-surgical. So potentially in those environments, you could do that. But aside from increasing short-term range of motion and decreasing short-term pain there isn't much more justification for it those are going to be the justifications uh when when you want to try to back it up with evidence other people will say it's going to do this this and this it'll make more room for nerves is that really true eh, i don't think so but the reality is a lot of people do feel that they get relief and if that's what the 
patient or client wants, even after you've informed them, then you kind of have to just go with what they're asking for at the end of the day. But, you know, that's just me. I think athletes will benefit from increasing threat ranges and potentially having to reinforce that with proper movement patterns. But if that's really not your focus and it's not um, something that's being detrimental to your performance, I don't think it's hundred percent necessary. Okay. So how would exactly spinal manipulation increase somebody's range of motion? Like what would be limiting them? It's an example of that. Like I know like SI joint is typically an issue for a lot of people and yeah. you know, they'll put it back into place or whatever. Uh, sure. But it always tends to fall back out because it's like this passive thing. So, yeah. So like that term right there, fall back out. Right. So like we don't want to get lost in those terms because those terms make it seem as if bones just move around freely. If bones mm -hmm. didn't move around that freely, oh my God, we could not play the sports that we did. We could not run the way that we do. Bones are way more stable and in place. When a true bone is dislocated, you are going to have much bigger problems than needing to go to the chiropractor. A true dislocation should be addressed by a specific, I believe it's orthopedic, um, that has to put it back the right way. And you have a very short term period to get it done right properly. Uh, in terms of subluxations, which is the word that they use in the chiropractic world, which is a true medical term, but not in that sense. Um, that's not really going to be the case. You will have irritation in certain areas. So when chiros adjust certain areas and you have a sense of relief, you are in theory adding movement, but you're just forcing the body to move in certain directions, right? Where it's just a passive movement because that's what that joint might need. So if you do strain an SI joint, you're going to have that sensation of, oh, it's locked up, right? Everyone gets that. I feel the sensation right here on this bony part. So even from a passive standpoint, which is what I believe personally, is that if you just get around that area, whether it's massage, movement, anything to get that joint to move, because when you feel pain and you actively try to move it, it's not comfortable. Mm -hmm. But when somebody else goes ahead and does it, it does feel a little bit more comfortable. So that allows you to get movement into that joint, hopefully sooner than what you would do if you just lay there and did nothing. That's why I say moving again is the, is the best thing for an injury is the quicker we can get back to movement, the better it's going to be for everything. But staying there stagnantly is going to typically cause further issues long term. This is a window of opportunity to work with then. Yeah, I will say from an, uh, from an outside of an athletic standpoint, especially there are a good amount of cases where like flexion distraction tables are very useful, especially for people who have disc related issues and nerve related issues or spinal canal stenosis. It could definitely be very, very relieving for those people, especially ones that aren't looking to get back into performance and are on those older populations that just need a bit of relief because it's that bit of relief that's going to even get them back on their feet and a lot of the sports world, it just likes to throw generalized statements and just say that this doesn't work, that doesn't work. And it's like, what populations are you talking about? Everyone mm -hmm. loves to act like they work with the top 1%. So they want to discuss and argue those little nuances, same way with training, right? It's like this angle, that angle. It's like, all right, you're getting really picky for who or for what. Um, but with this rehab world, they get so caught up in the uh, nuances of pain and certain people just need certain forms of relief. Like you, it's so individual dependent on the personality that walks through your door, who it is, what you know is going to work for them. Because not everyone's looking to get into a gym and, and squat. Yeah. You know, so that is where the variability in, okay, is this modality justified or not justified comes in. That's just from a person-based standpoint. Like people are oftentimes going to look for certain serv services and come in and they're like, I want this, this, and this done. And you're like, Oh, okay. Like, and you can, and you can give them all the information on it and they still will be a certain type of way. So you have to know how you're going to work with certain personalities and certain things people literally believe into working. So where I think something should be applied, like clients don't always listen to that either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you think the people that buy into, for let's say the average person, uh, maybe not the super active athlete, somebody like Nick or somebody like me that fall into, I got to go to the chiropractor every week and get adjusted or do a decompression table because if I don't, I have pain. Is that justifiable for that person with that passive treatment? Or do you think they're falling into like this fucking scam where they're being told that this is how they have to live in order to li manage their pain? I personally think that type of like thinking is incorrect. Like that for me, is hard like do I have people that come in often where we go over their health where we go over certain things like I actually will consult on nutrition with certain people not to a high degree 
by any means, but in terms of what's going on, I would love to, pra- I like practicing in every way that I can. So if, if I can push for me now, the cell is more so towards rehab than anything, right. Is I can help you get pain-free through proper movement. And whether that starts in the clinic or into the gym, that's the end goal. The end goal is to have everybody just move in that direction and like facilitate that the right way. But oftentimes certain people are coming in, whether, especially now when it's post-surgical or post-injury, there needs to be a clinical environment. I go about it. I use a lot of modalities. I try a lot of conservative things and I try a lot of more aggressive things. But I think that whole buy-in of you need to be here once a week to be pain-free. If you aren't checking off the the checklist of sleep, hydration, nutrition, and everything else that needs to go into re- true recovery. And that's what you think is your recovery. You have it wrong. Like that, you have to understand that recovery means two very different things. That's why it's so cool working f- with guys like you and Nick and other like bodybuilders because you guys are so hyper-focused on checking off all those boxes that when you are doing supplemental things, only you should be the ones that really, or other high performing athletes should check off this box as a um, supplemental thing and not so much from an injury standpoint. That's where the conversation of maintenance comes in with a lot of people. But do I think the general population needs to be going once a week because they said, I'm going to help you restore the curvature of your spine. That's crazy. I know a lot of people that have come in recently and they're like, my Cairo was telling me, I get it's a huge cell. People really believe it. They'll show them an X-ray of a spine that's straight, meaning like from this uh, when you're looking at it from the side. So when yeah. you see the side, they'll be like your cervical spine doesn't have a curvature that's required, and they'll sell people on trying to curve their spine. I'm truly blown away that that's a huge market for people. Yeah, that's that's pretty fucking crazy. But it is, and you're somebody like you who actually has a real severe you know sorry i'm not trying to put it out there but i mean you put it out there on the internet so. everybody knows everybody knows okay. yeah. i don't know how much you want me to share but like in terms of that like you have yeah, say anything issue and it's just people are out here marketing that they can just fix curves and there is certain cases where people's curvature changes but to say that it's from them is wild to me yeah no no definitely not not possible but uh <laughs> I was just gonna say, yeah. The, so the average, I mean, the average person, as we all know, is not very active. So I think that's where most people just get, fall into it. You know, they they go to a chiropractor, maybe they do some decompression, they feel better momentarily, then they go back to doing their nine to five, sitting in a chair all day, and then they don't work out at all, barely have any activity, and the only way they ever get back to that relief is going to the decompression, and they fall into that that lifestyle rather than actually being fucking healthy. And I think that's also a big reason why like chiropractors and these passive treatments get a bad reputation is because the average population is not people who are actively doing all this shit in addition to that. So it almost like reflects the people that are providing the passive treatment. It's it's like not necessarily their fault. Obviously there's shitty, shitty people in every profession profession, but it's like people associate that with them trying to scam people that this is the way rather than understand that like, that's just one aspect that you use in addition to all the other shit that you should be doing, it just gives you that opportunity to improve. Yeah, no, I mean, a hundred percent. I think your job as a practitioner is to educate the people that come in through your doors in some way, shape or form, um, whether it's telling them what they have, how legitimate it is or understanding them, helping them understand their issue and hopefully finding them a solution. And that solution could be getting them to the right place, making another referral and just being honest and saying, I might not have the answers for this and Mm -hmm. I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste your money. That to me is what's lacking in a lot of practices. Now I shadowed a lot of practices just to find out what I didn't want to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And you are a good example because that's what you do with me. That's what I worked with. I worked with Jake before I worked with you and Jake was the one who referred me to you because he said, Hey, like this guy does more than me. You should go yeah. see this guy because I haven't been able to feel better with what we were doing. He's a great chiropractor, but he knows yeah. that you were doing more referring to you. And after so many sessions, you were basically like, yeah, you should go get referrals because like what we're doing isn't going to help. When I've worked with tons of people in the past where it's just like, come back at next week, come back next week. You know, you're going to have to do the decompression table for the rest of your life to live with this. And that's just, you know, <laughs> that's what I was told for years. Like you have to do this. I spent tens and thousands of dollars going, I would spend $300 every week. I lived in Florida for a year straight to use a decompression table every fucking week for a that's whole crazy. year. Insane. That's insane to me. And those people just like took it. Yeah. Like knowing you're, you're in actual serious pain and those people just took it. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, but 
You know, I don't I, know, man. <laughs> it's just, it rubs me the wrong way. Yeah. I have surgery scheduled in two weeks. Do you? Yeah. I was going to ask for updates, dude, because me and Nick were talking about you today and I, he was asking what was going on. I was like, I haven't, I was going to podcast today, so I didn't know what the deal was. Yeah, no, uh, I went down. I saw a few different ones. I saw a guy down in Manhattan. Uh, okay. It's a good hospital. Very good. Yeah. Orthopedic. Um, yeah, we have surgery scheduled for the 25th. So I got to go back to speak. Quick, man. That's awesome. I'm so happy. Yeah, I know. I'm excited. It's a micro disectomy, well, mi- micro disectomy slash decompression. Nice. So they're going to take off. It's not a full laminectomy. Yeah. But they're going to take off enough to give. Yeah. Like room. So the dick is a little bit. Yeah, because he said he won't really know until he goes in there. Um, all the guys kind of said similar shit, but there's no point in touching the disc or cutting part of it off if there's not something like to take there. Because otherwise, if they put a hole in it, it could just cause it to, you know, extrude out more and yeah. cause more problems. But if they give it room so that it's not compressed and I have more range of motion within it, uh, like over time, it could potentially just, you know, reabsorb, go back mm-hmm. in. But if they fuck with it, it could, you know, potentially just cause more problems. Okay. So Damn. that's awesome. Well, I'm excited for you. Yeah. You have to keep me updated on that. Cause like I said, man, I just had a couple of guys that went through it and like relief was almost instant. Mm-hmm. That's like, what they were saying. Yeah. So fingers crossed. I just, I just want you to feel better. Like I said, you're such a, you hide it so well, you would never even know that you're in that much pain and you look at your MRI and yeah, just shocked, honestly, more than anything. Yeah, no, they either they were doing all the tests on me. They're like fucking bending over and stuff. And they're like, How are you doing this? And I'm like, I'm in pain right now. Like, I'm just I can still do it though. <laughs> You're just stone cold. It's kind of wild. I don't yeah. I, most people like for the people that are gonna watch this, it's insane. Your spinal cord is quite literally being just pressed on so hard, and you are doing 90 pound RDLs and <laughs> and stuff like that is so crazy to me. And it's I'm not doing Go ahead. I was doing 500 pound RDLs. Yeah, bro. With your spinal cord being compressed is pretty insane. And to be able to push through it and build the physique that you have built while having this for eight years. Eight right? years, yeah. Is insanity. I don't know what it is in you. Maybe you don't have a proper gene that like makes you feel pain the same way as everybody else or express it. I You just don't feel it the same way as everyone else, I guess. It's just the the dog in me. Yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> I don't know, but it's it, I don't even know what it's like to not feel it. It will be crazy if I wake up and just not have that pain. They said you could feel better the next day, four to six weeks of like light physical therapy stuff. After like two months, I should be able to like basically do everything, but wait four to six months to actually be like heavy squatting and yeah. deadlifting. Impression. So yeah. that's like full full blown lifting after four to six months, but I can't even imagine what it's like to be able to just like connect with this leg and like be able to flex it like without pain. Yeah. I think that'll be interesting. And to be completely honest, that's still going to be something that's that, that portion of it could be the part that is more delayed than anything. The pain portion is what they're going to try to address first and foremost, rebuilding that pattern, especially from a neural standpoint is what could, I mean, in certain cases could be like that, but in other cases could be the one that's a little bit more, drug out but you have to understand if that pressure is no longer on that nerve in theory you will have to just rebuild that and it should Mm -hmm. come back sometimes just a little bit slower for people but in your case i don't think that's going to be the case at all just because of how much hypertrophy you've already been able to create and not have such a discrepancy i'm hoping and truly believing that that's going to come back fairly quick yeah i hope so it'll be it'll be interesting to see we have a a good transformation come back from surgery Oh up. yeah, I think it'll be I think it'll be awesome with what you've been able to accomplish already, dude. I don't and you trying to do this pain free, you're gonna be in such a better spot. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be good. Just ready to get it over with. But we were talked about chiropractic. Yep. Let's talk about deep tissue, right? Yeah. Deep tissue is a huge thing, huge for bodybuilding. Why? So for me personally, it's understanding stress management that's the angle that i take with it because in terms of the science that everyone preaches and what everyone markets isn't really there for me the i'm gonna break up your scar tissue i'm gonna do this and this and toxins and all that stuff the body does a lot of that on its own and like i said before if you're not checking off the checklist of other things such as what really goes into recovery 
getting deep tissue is really not going to do much for you. If you're not a good bodybuilder and you cheat on your diet and you don't train properly or you overtrain or you don't sleep enough or drink enough water, that's going to kill you way more than you not being able to go in and get deep tissue done. Deep tissues, I hate to say it, it's, it is a luxury to an extent. And it's a luxury if you're, cause you're paying for it out of pocket and you're paying for it in certain ways. You want to make sure you get all those other things done before you're trying to get that extra stuff done. Like I said, going back to your, uh, your question for me, it's about managing an athlete's stress. So we'll go over what they're doing, like what their training is looking like, what's their volume, like what's their load, like depending on the certain case of client, those are the things that you want to actually address first, ask them about their health, ask them about their hygiene with like sleep, with nutrition. If those things are lacking, address those, then move forward. I'll ask them how they feel after certain workouts, if things felt off at all, if they feel like they've been restricted in any way, because that's essentially what they're coming in for is, Hey, I feel tight here, or I feel this, or I feel that. And a lot of that stuff is perception. That's what I want people to know is muscle tightness is sensation. It's not true tightness in a lot of cases unless it's true true injury it's not true tightness tightness is a perception the length the origin and insertion of that muscle is never going to change right so when someone says i have this type of tightness it's just perception it's sensation right it's the feeling that you have of tightness it's not that that muscle is actually shortened and it could be different in tone it could be different in potential texture but it's not really going to be as short as people describe it to be um, same thing with knots they're not exactly what people think they are. You can't just put an elbow into something and be like, I'm going to get this out. Because oftentimes you're going over scar tissue, could be calcium deposits, could even be fat deposits in certain cases. And this philosophy of I got to put manual therapy on here and try to get it out as much as possible could be dangerous and even more detrimental to bodybuilders because you're trying to manage their cortisol and stress levels. So at this level, at this point, what I help like with Nick is stuff, is one with the hamstring, right? So there are injuries that we want to monitor, make sure they feel normal. I like ask him how he feels for his workouts. If anything has changed, has like readiness or preparedness gone down. And those are things that are supposed to be managed <clears throat> typically through exercise, but at his level, he's already micromanaging so many other things. That's why he's able to do these supplemental things for us to manage things. Has range of motion been severely taken away? Is there any like swelling, bruising, all those things? But like going to, uh, you said manual, sorry, got myself lost for a second. Deep tissue, deep tissue. Deep tissue. With deep tissue, for you guys, it's super relieving. And that is something that I think you can take away from it the most. And I truly believe that's why most people go and get it done. It feels good, right? And well, it, fuck it, it hurts like a motherfucker, well, doesn't it? In certain cases, yeah, it does definitely be, uh, hurt. But like the goal isn't pain from it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people market pain. A lot of people market that this is, if I can find pain, then this is right. Do I, I think there's certain things that are intense for sure, but they're very specific things. I don't think that you go in for a deep tissue or you go in for manual therapy and you come out bruised and battered as the goal. And there are some people that really believe that that is the goal. Yeah. So you say tightness is a perception is, uh, but then you also said like knots are not what they think they are. So what do you, what is it? when you see somebody like, you know, they're digging their elbows in your trap and they're like, Oh, you feel that knot. And then like, you'll feel something release, right? You could feel something like you'll feel the like little fucking rivet or whatever. And they go over it so many times and hammer it until eventually it releases. What is that? There are certain things such as trigger points and referral patterns that have been confirmed. And that's why trigger point therapy is very highly marketed and highly involved in the pain therapy world that you can get behind. But in terms of what people think knots really are, it's not just a ball, a clumped up muscle tissue that you can just release and it'll let go. Mm. That concept has to be removed. And that's what I'm trying to say is knots in that sense aren't real. You can get hypersensitivities in certain areas of the body, whether it's due to localized injury or inflammation, and it can feel a certain type of way. That is very common. And so are certain cases such as, like I said, for calcium deposits, the but when the body undergoes certain types of injuries they can deposit calcium in certain areas and there are certain cases where you feel tendons and ligaments rolling over certain parts of bone and that can be like clicking sensation rolling sensations so a lot of that stuff is very common in people we can't necessarily remove it 
um, unless you do it in a very invasive way with needles. But when it comes to bodybuilders, you guys have obviously the extracurriculars that come with bodybuilding, and that can develop a lot of scar tissue, especially repetitive trauma to certain areas. But there's a huge side of that that pe people fail to neglect, and that's the like genetic portion and how it sits with a certain person. Not everyone's going to scar the same way. Other people have a very negative response to constant trauma to their body like that. So other people are just going to scar over, and that type of scarring, you're not just going to get rid of. It's quite literally impossible, no matter how much force you put onto that area. And there's a higher chance you do more damage to somebody when you're trying to get certain levels of scar tissue to go away. So you can't just scrape out scar tissue. No, that like philosophy is very odd to me. You can't just <laughs> scrape away. You're going to put somebody in severe pain yeah. in an attempt to do that. You could cause more, way more damage and even nerve damage because there's certain nerves that are very superficial to the muscles and towards the skin. And if you push in certain areas hard enough, you could definitely cause a good amount of nerve damage for, for people and pain. Yeah. I don't know what it is about this whole putting people in pain thing that's like marketable yeah it, uh, uh, it works I, I never want to put somebody in pain if, it, if it's the reality of that comes with their symptoms i mean it is what it is you have to continue in that direction sometimes you have to lean into certain levels of pain especially with movement but to optionally put somebody and voluntarily do it is kind of crazy to me <laughs> mm -hmm. now what did i just say <laughs> pain, manual therapy the deep tissue, the knots, the can't scrape the scrape. Out scar. oh, so scar tissue, scar tissue would uh, the only way to get rid of scar tissue is, is time, no, or it's surgery, like it should heal on its yeah, own. So there's, surg time. there's surgical interventions. Um, there's very like mediocre research on potentially passive modalities such as lasers and ultrasound, but I don't know how confirmed that is and how good it would actually be. I don't mm. think it's enough data to actually prove that it's doing a good amount. Um. And a lot of people just tend to just live with it, especially in this sport. Like just one of those cases, you could try and figure out certain things that might work better for you and cause less like inflammatory reactions, hopefully, but not everyone's that smart. Not everyone that has those um, resources yeah. and time to do that. Cause there are some people that I've learned over time when it comes to the manual side of my practice, certain people feel so different. Uh, from a even from a texture standpoint a muscle tone standpoint mobility standpoint and you see that throughout populations of ages of non-enhanced athletes obviously you see that with young kids you see the pliability the flexibility you see the high level athlete in uh high school and college and you see like you see muscle tone kind of changing you see muscle tone change with age and then you see muscle tone change with peds and that's a whole different level and a whole different ball game. It's so much individuality that people overlook a lot of that. You think there's just not a lot of research on it to even I just don't think fully explain it? Yeah, I just don't think there's ever going to be funding. And I just think a lot of it is genetic resources and how you go about what you go about. Yeah. When it comes to bodybuilding, essentially, everyone's trying to do the same thing now, right? Everyone's trying to learn the same protocols. Everyone's trying to learn the same, or not the same training, but the, re the research is so good that we're getting really good at understanding it. So everyone's trying to do it at the highest level, but you still see the differences. Like I can see the differences between amateurs, locals, regional, even national level athletes. And then you see very high level professional athletes and you see the differences in just their body's capabilities. And it's so, it's very, very unique. Yeah. I talked about this briefly on the last podcast I did about how, if you like decide to take gear, you agree to essentially be a lab rat to an extent and it's like kind of goes with what you're saying here because we've talked about this before too is how you just said it how everybody accepts gear peds differently and it could just be the oil it could just be the injection itself just from stabbing yourself and how you tolerate that if you you know develop scar tissue more yep. than others if you are more inflammatory because then you think of like those guys that's at the top you think how the fuck can these guys you know inject <laughs> that amount of gear into themselves and not have so much scar tissue and not lose all their separation and they some do to an extent but it's like you have to not necessarily just be a hyper responder to gear but you have to be able to accept gear without issues because you take me like i would pin my glutes glutes turn to scar tissue um it tends to be that region specifically more than others but you know, there's no way that anybody could know that before actually going through it. So you might be somebody who 
pins and it just might fuck you up and it could be any oil or it might just be MCT oil or it might just be grapeseed oil or it could just be you can't use anything less than a 27 gauge needle maybe or you just get yeah. fucked up. It's just there's so there's there's so many variables and there's no way to know until you like go through it and experiment with all of it. Yeah, when I when I talk to guys that are at a higher caliber and they talk about how certain things they notice changes so easily and it's so interesting to me because you have to have so many variables under control to be able to pinpoint that's the one thing that changed and often get times it's usually guys at the highest level that are just doing one variable at a time in certain cases not always it really just depends everyone like you know some guys do change too much too quick but knowing that they know that even this minor change in whatever it may be protocol we'll call it is going to cause this type of effect is so is so unique because you see why they're at that level whereas guys at the lower level don't you couldn't tell you couldn't tell what exactly it is that causes them to react that type of way mm. because they don't have all those check boxes done um and they might not even have the you can't even say it's genetic because you haven't checked off all the other boxes genetics is very so, such a small conversation that comes in which you do have at the highest level because that's when it matters that's when it makes a big difference so that's why i use those guys at that level as an example those guys always respond in so many better ways there's a reason they can get to that level there's a reason why so many people at the local amateur regional whatever national level so many are trying but can't get to that level or won't have that ability because they just one their bodies might not respond the way that these other guys do two their bodies might not be able to make it longevity wise or injuries are more prone to it um whether they check off all the other boxes of like even like we can talk about the mental side of it getting it being able to tolerate so many things like so many things have to be in order and aligned for you to be able to get to that level and i hate to say it for a lot of people but hard work isn't going to be enough there's yeah. a certain portion of it that's you got to be gifted especially in this sport now with the populations that there are that are getting into it and the people that are coming uh more and more into it like you see the people that are coming and they're freaks like you know they're just about everybody coming out that's a big name is oh my god that's a genetic freak mm -hmm. because the populations are just getting bigger and bigger and like i said hard work's just not going to be enough and i wish there'd be certain guys that would just let it go because i see it in their bodies i see mm -hmm. certain things I'm like, your body's rejecting this, but you're not stopping. Yeah, no, terrible. Fucking acne all over. They look like they're literally dying. Their bodies are red from high blood pressure. It's like, there's there's no no hope for them making it, but they uh, just continue continue the dream, which I guess is admirable. I don't know. <laughs> it's that level, but at a certain point, man, I see certain guys that are just, their whole body's just scarred. And yeah. I'm just, dude, how do you move? Like, how do you... I don't even know how you get into certain ranges. Like you're not going to be able to sit down properly. And people think it's like, I'm over exaggerating. Like, no, there are certain people's bodies and textures that you touch and they just feel rock solid. And I'm not talking like that good dense muscle. I'm talking their body. Just, you know, when you have a bad, when people have a bad shot, it feels really so hard and really solid. Yeah. And inflamed. It's like the whole, like so many parts of their body just feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely fucked. Now, <laughs> somebody who responds that way do you think doing like that manual even though there's you know there that's going to keep happening but doing manual work like that like tissue work would that help with that in theory just moving stuff around so they say could yeah. possibly help but at that point unless that person stops i hate using the word but stops abusing it because mm -hmm. at that point it really is abusing you're yeah. hurting yourself if they don't stop abusing it you, no, no matter what you do, it's not really going to change because inflammation goes up, up, down, up, down, up, down, no matter the case. But when you're inflicting it on a weekly basis or biweekly or every other day, who knows, whatever, it's there's nothing that you're really going to be able to do to decrease those levels of inflammation. You could cold plunge all you want, sauna, or you want get manual work done. If you're not a good responder to certain things, it's probably better you don't play with certain things. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But okay. Back to, back to the tissue here. Cause I, I wanted you to clarify this. People have pain, you know, let's say I have pain in my shoulder or yeah. side of my leg. You're saying it's all, you know, basically in your head. Not entirely. There are certain cases where certain nerves 
can become irritated, can become compressed. And I'm not saying manual therapy will relieve that in long-term permanently. You can get temporary relief. Some people will have longer lasting relief. Some people will have none and some people will have amazing relief. So it's so hard to say. I fall in the middle with it, you know, because not everybody that comes through my door is looking for that or needs that essentially. Do I implement it in a lot of my cases? Yeah. Do I implement it with people like bodybuilders because that's what they're looking for? For sure. Um, do I implement it with people that are doing rehab? I've had a couple of recent like lower extremity injuries recently, tears, um, post-surgical, whatever the case is. Do I implement it with them and also implement it together with rehab? Yeah. But in terms of do I think it's going to solve a person's solutions entirely? Never. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So what do you think the major difference is between, you know, average person who just goes to the gym versus somebody who's a more advanced athlete. Cause what I would think is there's a point where, you know, you could get away with a lot of shit. Cause you're really not putting yourself, you're objectively not putting your body through that much compared to take somebody like Nick, or even like me, like you're squatting fucking 400 pounds consistently. Like you go in, you do manual tissue work, but then you go back into the gym and you create all this damage, like a significant amount of damage to your body. And you feel like you constantly that you need it, but that going in and getting tissue work helps to relieve tension, helps you feel more mobile. What exactly is occurring there? That's, you know, creating that. Why is, why is there a significant difference between somebody who's at a higher level and the yeah. average person? No, for, I mean, for those guys, managing every aspect of stress is the name of the game, right? Not just bodybuilding. It's all their sports. There is a uh, believe Usain Bolt, at the height of his career was getting pre-workout massages and post-workout massages. Very light, very, very light type of work. But at that level, you're just trying to manage every level of stress. And soft tissue work is a form of stress. So you do want to, when you're talking about very, very high level, you want to mitigate that trauma and stress as close to other periods of stress. So if it's post-workout, it's actually one of the quote unquote best time to get certain things done just because we can limit trauma to a certain area. So then the rest of the 23 hours, 24 hours, whatever it may be, is spent in full recovery. It's a form of micro trauma, essentially, but in another way, it's also very therapeutic when we talk about manual work and massage therapy. That's where the therapeutic side really comes in. I know massage therapy has been scientifically proven to help with anxiety and depression the most when you talk about full-blown research. Um, and it's that human touch aspect that really brings that on where somebody can decompress and relax and you're giving that trust into this person. So when you're that trustworthy or vulnerable with this person, then you're truly, truly actually trying to remain stress-free in those moments. That's why people don't want to be on their phones. They want to be stimulated by other things. They're trying to just decompress in that time period. That's where you're trying to implement that with super high level high level athletes where you're trying to decrease cortisol levels, hopefully by putting them in an environment and going through therapeutic movements to allow them to actually decompress. So stress management at the highest level, that's where I would put it. For the general everyday person, it can be implemented in an acute injury type of way. It, it's not necessary to be doing manual work for a full body or for just to do it. Okay, so you're saying it's stress management. So in that case, why don't why doesn't Nick Walker just go get a Swedish calming massage versus you digging into him? Yeah, I mean, the, so for him to an extent, it's just going to be certain pressures. It's going to be certain things that feel relieving to him. Um, it's also like our understanding of of anatomy is different from whether it's a massage therapist and that's no taste on massage therapist by any means. They're some of the smartest people I know. It's just some people's understanding of what we're looking for, whether it's like testing for range of motion, testing for different muscle tone, muscle texture, comparing it to before and afters, uh, whether they're showing signs and symptoms of having a potential for, you can't really assume injury, but if you start losing certain ranges of motion, you want to be able to look out for those things. Or if they have other symptoms that they want to be able to inform to you, for me, it's just an educational difference. You could be on the same level from a manual therapy standpoint as a massage therapist. That really isn't going to matter, but it's really going to be how you're implementing it, when you're implementing it, um, and not just doing it, oh, I go and get this done once a week from this person or a different person every week. You want to be able to work with somebody consistently to help you manage those things, and that's where I fall in with Nick in terms of the manual therapy side of it. 
Yeah. I don't just mean the like their their level of education. I just mean like the amount of the amount of pressure because you're saying that it's more of like a therapeutic stress management thing. And I could go and get a therapeutic massage and feel great, be on fucking Hawaii and you know, I have yeah. this great blissful massage, but ultimately I'll feel better with, you know, a 300 pound motherfucker digging their elbows into me. It's going to hurt, but afterwards yeah. I'll feel better. It goes back. So this goes back to like the trigger point science. And that's why trigger point needles are so effective where dry needling is super helpful. That pressure itself is going to be more relieving and desensitizing when you have an external pressure of a larger human being falling into certain areas, right? The glutes are very commonly a sensitive area for people's lower body. When you have that much external pressure from a sensational and perception standpoint, it's going to desensitize that area more. When you get very used to a 300 pound man putting that type of pressure there and whether it's adding movement or not, it's going to do more in terms of desensitization. So that way, when you let go, or when I stop putting that pressure in, you're gonna be like, wow, that's a lot of relief. Whereas if you do get that Swedish done, it's very superficial. That one's more so strictly therapeutic. Like I said, there are gonna be moments of intensities, but the overall goal for man from a manual therapy standpoint should be stress management. It's not going to be to let's put this person in as much pain as possible. Okay, so do you think that comes back to basically like the level that that person is at? So somebody with me that has more muscle tissue than the average person or somebody like Nick or compared to, let's say, like Marissa, right? You know, yeah. do you think the more tissue required, typically there's going to be more pressure to require that type of response? Like yeah, if you have more resilience? Theory, for sure. I'd say in theory, yeah. I'm not saying that only larger people can work on larger people it's not because you have people that can apply pressure is just pressure it's how much you apply how much you can get from it but in theory yeah to get the same level of sensation you have to factor in that this person's four times the size of the size of somebody else mm -hmm. it's and muscle tissue is so different and so, the texture is so different and pressures are going to change based off of the type of person you're working with nick's a great example nick's muscle tissue is so soft mm -hmm. it doesn't need that much and nick has actually told me he hates going and getting work done in places where it's very painful he doesn't like that much pressure and it's has a lot to do with the fact that his body just probably doesn't need it to that level people assume that because he's bigger that he does need that kind of pressure but he needs very specific type of pressure and that's what said he even knows exactly what he wants with that that's why he lets very few people put hands on him does that make sense yeah that's crazy so I don't know if you could even compare this. If you know, would you say that you had to use more pressure on me or with Nick? I'm oh, my landslide more on you. Also, crazy. Yeah. you're but dude, your spinal cord is being compressed. Like the fact yeah. that you can function like that and your pain tolerance is up there. When I ask you, Hey, can you even feel this? I don't even, you I can't even gauge on a one to 10 where you're really at when I ask you certain things because your, your analog is so different from everybody else's. So my, you're, so basically what you're getting is that my, perception of pain is so high that you need to meet above that in order to desensitize in theory i mean it doesn't have to go so far it doesn't have to go so far past it necessarily because even if if your if your pain is already at this level and we go ahead and try to i might not have to push that much more to desensitize that area um whereas it's just everyone's going to respond differently and you respond so different to pain like you sit there perfectly fine while your spinal cord is being compressed so your ability to uh, like gauge pain, I'm not saying it's off, but you've been in it for so long. It'd be hard for me to use general um, analogs and numbers to try to get a gauge from you. But yeah. yes, in, I've had to press more on you. You have compression on nerves. Your sensation is not the same. Yeah. So it's like when I say I feel like there's something deep in my glute and it fucking hurts and it's this pain and you digging in there, right? You putting all this pressure. It's not like you're releasing anything when you're doing that you're just causing this external force for me to basically perceive the pain differently and mentally not have that focus in that spot because you've now created this almost like illusion no yeah i mean in a way because i mean you know yeah in a way yeah it does fall to be that because it's your brain's understanding and sense of sensation and knowing how it is so when you get injured and you lose that range of motion your body naturally assumes that it's not going to want to go back to that range of motion because mm -hmm. it'll be very painful or we got hurt here before so you get tight so if we can apply that external sensation that external pain and allow you to go through certain ranges of motion when you let go of it your body 
wants to say, okay, it's not as bad as before. We can access this range of motion. Let's keep doing that more and more. It doesn't have to be so severe. You don't have to be bruising people up, but that's the application that I have with a lot of my clients. Let's go ahead and see what kind of range of motion we can access under pressure. And hopefully it'll allow us to get there in a pain-free way when we remove that pressure. Yeah. So you have somebody that, you know, is having shoulder pain. So you apply pressure to their infraspinatus boot. They, yeah. You know, you move the shoulder around. That's basically to get the joint to move while you're applying this external pressure. And then when they get up, they feel like they have more mobility because you've used that force. And it's basically to get them to keep. Now they have this window of opportunity to work within that and improve that because you've done that. Am I right here? Yeah, no, that's 100% right. That's that's how I go about it at my practice. Not everyone's going to agree with that. Not everyone's a believer in that, but that's essentially how I personally go about it. And it does, you know, we get some great results. We get some not so great results, but we just try to keep learning from every single one. It's more of a, more of a nerve thing than you actually hitting the infraspinatus and it's released now. It's re this, yeah. wa this bound of knots have been released. It's not happening. No, yeah, that's exact. I mean- to go back to the original stuff, yeah, that's exactly how I, I would go about it. You're not releasing anything in certain areas. You're helping people regain certain ranges of motion, hopefully pain-free. Mm -hmm. So then what exactly is myofascial release and trigger points? Like what is that specifically? So trigger point now is, depends, are you trigger point therapy, which is from a manual therapy standpoint, and then you have trigger point injections, which... I believe with trigger point injections, they found that it wasn't what they were injecting into the muscle for muscle relief. It was what it was the needle actually going into the muscle. So it was the actual act of the needle. And that's where dry needling has taken such a big um, spike in practice and mo as a modality. And I've had it done myself. It's been quite helpful personally. And you notice it. Like I try not to buy into things. Very often I try to fall very in the middle and see whatever it is that needs to be done. But the results that I had personally with dry needling, I'm, I'm referring a good amount of my clients to go and get it done if I can, or if I feel as if it could be helpful. Um, that's, that's where I find the trigger point stuff very doable in terms of manually. It's going to be very similar. It's by applying that pressure to those certain trigger points. That's where referral patterns come into uh, where, like I said, where we, pinch that infraspinatus and you feel it on the front of the delt oftentimes, or it might even go down the hand. You pinch certain sensations. You can put pressure on certain nerves where you're going to feel it all the way down. That could be a trigger point pattern or a trigger point referral. So that's one of the ways that we do quote unquote treat from a manual therapy standpoint. You're hoping to get the same form of relief that a needle would, but obviously, you know, go ahead. It's the It's the same thing we were just talking about. It's just the external pressure environment yeah. yeah yeah there's no like real difference they they have so many different names for like manual therapy that's why i just call it manual therapy and i don't really like get into the nuances of like because then there's active release and there's myofascial release and then there's trigger point release and it's like you're all doing the same thing so it's all said myofascial release same thing as trigger point same thing we're talking about there's no actual fucking release of well, the like yeah like fascia. you're not if, if your fascia is so so strong and people think that they're just releasing it with pressure of their elbows is insane because like you would need a ton but i remember in school we were trying to cut it through it with scalpels and it was hard mm -hmm. and that's something that people like, especially certain connective tissues you can't just push through them like that you do get sensational changes but you're not going to get actual physical changes um people who are super into the myofascial manual therapy world like you know, the polarizing end of it, they get into the crazy nuances and sciences of, oh, at this level, there's like this, this, and this having at the microscopic level. And you could really, really get into it, but there's no good research out there that actually shows those yet. Maybe in the gotcha. future, hopefully we can say we're wrong, but not right gotcha. now. Gotcha. Yeah. So the dry needling, the benefit of dry needling is the same thing. It's the external needle going in. It's not the needle hitting anything necessarily in like, you know, fucking releasing a knot. It's really just, yeah, it's definitely good. There's going to be certain areas where there is a good amount of science. Like, oh, Kairos aren't certified in Jersey to do it. So I personally don't have enough experience. And when I don't know something on it, I just refer yeah. out for it. So, my one of the local docs that came and did it on my neck, um, he was explaining it. Obviously, he has way more experience with it and science with it. But 
he was hitting certain points in my neck and it felt super intense and was very achy afterwards. So like, you know, there was some form of trauma done or some form of modality was had happened. And then the next day I woke up and the relief was very, very significant. And I've had two very, very severe injuries to that area. So to feel that was awesome because I tried, I've tried so many different things um, to relieve stress and tension in those areas and nothing really worked. And this was so pinpoint. Well, why do you think that is though? In terms of like why the release was so like yeah. significant. I just think you can't really get much more specific than a needle going into certain areas. And when you're, if you understand anatomy and you're good at anatomy, you know where actual muscles are and you're bound to hit them or feel them in a certain type of way that you can't from the outside. Like when you peel the skin off, it, it's very, very visible, the anatomy of the human body. And if you have a good understanding of where certain things are, I don't see any reason as to why you can't try to pinpoint as close as you can. So where. when you're hitting the muscle with the needle though, again, is it just the fact that the muscles that the needle is hitting the muscle and now it's causing this inflammatory response to, you know, have the recovery process happen there? So that I'm assuming that's, like I said, I haven't taken, I yeah. I'm not certified in that. Like I refer out for acupuncture and dry needling now okay. because it's not in my scope, but I'm assuming it's something along those lines. Uh, when my buddy did explain it to me, he said something about the collagen forming around the needle. I want to say collagen or some forming, something forming around the needle when you spin it. And when he had actually let me try, we had it in one of my buddy's forearms and I had spun it. It actually, you could notice it was getting tighter. And that was super interesting and intriguing. And he said that something within the body actually does start forming around it to create a barrier. Obviously, it's responding to something being inserted. So there's going to be some form of response from the body. But you could notice the needle was just getting tighter as you continue to spin it. Um, and that was a part of some form of response from the body. Like I said, don't quote me on that. I'm not 100% sure exactly what the process was. I could definitely ask him more into it. Yeah. Um, but the relief that I got, the relief that my buddy got, was very, very noticeable. Uh -huh. And like I said, I don't buy into things. and I don't make one thing a modality, but I would definitely like to know more about it and see what kind of responses other people can get from it. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I'll have to, I'll have to try it with a 23 gauge after this. <laughs> see if it gets, see if it gets tighter. <laughs> Any response? Yeah. No, it was, it was very cool to see. I, I love seeing things. I love seeing new things. I love trying uh, new things. And if there's a response and I'm not going to sit there and be delusional. I don't, I, I, there was a huge response in terms of like achiness at first. And then, like I said, woke up the next morning and I texted him and I was like, whatever you did to my one side, I'm going to need you to do that to my other side because there was yeah. such a noticeable difference. Yeah. That's cool. I, I've only done it a few times, but I think it's a practitioner. It's a huge practitioner thing too. Like going to one person and writing something off, yeah, because, like somebody's skill set, like I even see it now and what I saw in school and what I see in the massage therapy world and even the PT world, everybody practices so differently. Don't just write it off because one experience didn't go well. Yeah, as like you said, with everything, there's shitty chiropractors, shitty massage therapists, maybe not even necessarily shitty, but it's just maybe they're not the person for you. You might be more advanced this is why yeah. I always say it's it's so hard to find a good massage therapist or chiropractor or somebody that does all that shit specifically for bodybuilders or athletes you know i think they could do good work for the majority of the general population but somebody to do good work on somebody at a higher level that needs more it's very hard to find somebody i think it's just the, them understanding the complexities that are you know involved with being an athlete and them having a better more in-depth understanding of anatomy to say because i guess for the general population you maybe not need you may not need that deep level of understanding compared to working with a higher level person or athlete yeah. no 100 percent. that's just that's just a given what comes with working with a high level athlete is just understanding that person and their sport and what it is that goes into it and it's not necessarily that you need to understand their sport because fundamentally and phys like physiology doesn't really change from person to person does training change obviously that's the biggest difference in athletes is training is going to be different but once you understand what goes into it and what the objective is the majority of the people it's going to take the same way to get to get there from managing their stress, managing their nutrition. Um, those don't change. Fundamentals for everything across the board is always going to stay the same. Where you make your changes and variables is what's going to determine, can I work with this level? Can I work with this level? Can I work with this level? And you can work with all of them. I know a lot of guys that just work with every level 
it's just in different proportions, different percentages. And you just got to know when to pull, when to give. And it's just basically dialing it here, dialing it there. When yeah, it I think it, to being a practitioner. Yeah, I think it also has to do with, you know, knowing maybe, maybe it's not necessarily strength. I think there is strength to a degree, but also knowing how to apply like pressure to the different people. Cause that's the one thing that I've always struggled with because now you're saying, you know, it has to do with the external, you know, pressure that you, how you perceive pain and whatnot. And it's like, with the pain that I've felt, it's like nine out of 10 people just have never been able to actually apply enough pressure or apply the pressure right for what I needed. So it's always yeah. been usually, yeah, I've had some small guys do it fine. Uh, but you know, the women that I've seen, just the majority of guys, uh, they've never been able to get the job. That's usually been guys that are athletes or just typically bigger, stronger people or the guys that understand, you know, physiology a lot better uh, and anatomy that have been able to do it correctly. So I feel like that plays a part as well. For sure. A hundred. Oh yeah. I, I agree with that. It's definitely having knowledge on what this person does. I love to know who I'm working with and what it is that's walking through my door. And it just gives me a much better understanding of how are things going to go. And I even said with you in the beginning, like I couldn't get a good feel because I didn't, wasn't sure what it was that you were feeling because you don't show that level of pain realistically for the, what your MRI looked like and how you were presenting it and what you were saying about your pain wasn't being portrayed in your physical body at all. You weren't mm -hmm. showing it in your I don't want to say posture, but in your demeanor, like you weren't showing it at all. Like you're just straight face, just like this. Nobody would really know that you're sitting there with your spinal cord just being boom, like compressed. Yeah. Like you're just yeah. doing it. So that, <laughs> that like definitely made it a little hard because I wanted to know, because I didn't want to waste your time. I didn't want to waste your time. I didn't want to waste your money. Like I just wanted yeah. to know, all right, is this going to be a lot more serious or is it not serious? Um, do I have to refer out for surgery? Let's refer out somebody who knows better than I do with this. But after seeing what we did and trying what we tried, it just didn't make, it just didn't make sense. It, it, it's funny you say that because it just reminded me of something the other day. Um, I think it's almost some level of it's like a pride thing. Like I just don't ever want to complain about anything and I just want to fucking suck it up and like be a man. Like I, I will, like I'm, I'll beat the pain. Like the pain's yeah. not going to, pain's not going to win the situation. I'm at the doctor and he like, I'm like sitting up, you know, it's just like the most uncomfortable chair. Like I fucking am in pain i'm just sitting there and like it's like a scene from a movie where i'm just like waiting for it to be over and it's like there's like sirens going off <laughs> and he like puts my leg up so my leg's straight like literally the worst position i could be in my sack nerves on fire yep. he's like sitting there talking to me and i can't even hear anything he's saying and i'm just waiting for the whole conversation to be over but it's like in his perspective he has absolutely no fucking idea what's going on in my mind at that moment yeah and it's, which, it's is just like, <laughs> which is so not helpful for like a professional because they need as much honest, accurate information, and you're just sitting there just fighting it because your pride is so important to you. But your spinal cord is like, no, I this this sucks. And you're just sitting there like, don't you dare let him know. <laughs> yeah, because like I don't want to like get up and start pacing around. Now I look like a crackhead. Like oh, I can't sit down. It's just like <laughs> I just got to sit this out so this guy's fucking done talking. No, people do. People got to know. That's why it, I tell people to be like specific as possible. Let me know what's going on. Like it can't just be a a vague answer when i get vague answers it's so hard for me to like offer anything or do anything because i don't know what direction it is and like i said at the end of the day it always comes down to you're trying to respect this person's time and their money and if you're not finding answers or getting answers for this person for why they're feeling the way that they're feeling especially you like you're not a bodybuilder just looking to get body work done you are a bodybuilder that had a serious issue and you're asking questions you're coming in with loaded questions stuff that you have to do true research on to know certain things. Um, it's your, you know what I mean? Like I ha having the ability to give you those answers is very, I think it's awesome. It's cool for me. Like I, I can like, this is one of those cases where you can be like, I can give myself a pat on the back for being like, this is what I do think was justified and necessary. And you're not milking it out. You're, you're in serious pain and getting to that level of communication and understanding you is what allowed us to get to that answer of, Hey, we need to, we need to, fast track this to something more serious if we're going to be able to come back from it or even get you to a place that's not going to be detrimental to the rest of your life yeah you know yeah, definitely so you know after i get the surgery that's where all all that shit that we were doing is gonna actually come into play and you know for sure fast yeah, track me yeah 100 percent, dude you're i think even doing those things before going into the surgery was super huge because you were doing all the right things to strengthen certain areas and put yourself in the best position going into surgery. Yeah.
Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The last thing I want to talk about is your perspective on grassing and cupping. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. you know, I don't know what they call it when, you know, when they're scraping and all the blood comes out, they call it, they call it, they have a specific word for it. I believe it's patechiae. Yeah. Patechiae. Patechiae. Yeah. They say, you know, you're getting the toxins out. Same thing with cupping. They were, they refer to them similarly. Obviously grassing is more effective. You know, I'm sure you think that being super aggressive with it, I'm assuming probably isn't, you know, the best thing in your opinion, but what do you think the use of it for is what's wrong with the way people do it? You know, I, so how I go about using it is covering certain areas, broad areas with like less pressure. If certain people can't tolerate certain pressures in certain areas, I love using it in that case. Um, I like using it in post-surgical cases because for some people it can actually feel cold and that's why I'll implement it. Cause if they have like, if their area is like very swollen or heated or it feels warm, having some form of like cold sensation on there is really good. Um, honestly, a lot of times I'll use it to save my hands too, especially on big people. Just trying to protect my own hands. If my thumb slips the wrong way, I don't think it's something that you want to use to cause trauma on people. And I see that so often. I see it marketed in the craziest of ways where people are proud of the bruising that they've created. People are proud of the damage that they've done to someone just from an inflammation standpoint. And if you're going to get into bodybuilding and try to understand anatomy and physiology, if you're going in to do recovery work and you're walking out of there feeling like you got ran over by a truck and are bruised and battered, how is that going to possibly do anything for you? If you're feeling worse the day after getting stuff like that done, you're, it's really setting you back. Like It yeah. should be priming you to put you in a good position. Like I said, the goal is never pain or crazy intensity. It's just the right thing. Like mm -hmm. I, hate to, I hate to put it that way, but it's about finding the right thing for you. At that level, when you're doing manual work at that level, and you're getting it done. You're going to have your preferences. You're going to have your certain styles, but you have to know that doing extra damage to the body is not the goal. And mm -hmm. that, my theory on it is that people, when they do feel better a week later, it's because you just put your you just meat grinded your whole body. It just went through its own natural healing process because you just probably just inflamed the entire body. And at this point, it has to put inflammatory metabolites throughout your entire body to go and take care of all of it that your body's just one giant riddled thing of like let's clean this out let's clean this out i don't think the actual manual work is going to be removing toxins or cupping i don't think you're pulling anything there is a form of cupping called wet cupping where they pull blood yeah out of your body now personally if there was one that i would want to really get done it'd be that one yeah just because i don't really find it any different from getting rid of blood of your body in other ways now you have to go to a specific licensed acupuncturists that have the proper facility to be able to do this and do that. Um, and I want to say the science, the science behind that, I don't even, I don't even know if it's very science-based or if it's like meridian based, mm -hmm. uh, but the way I'll use cupping with a lot of my clients is actually, once again, with perception, um, increasing range of the motion, having that severe, severe suction sensation and external decompression and going through movement with it is awesome because we can really, really make somebody feel as if, okay, this is really, really tight. You apply that decompressive pressure, which does cause a huge, like, uh, what's that suction sensation. When you go ahead and get them going through certain ranges of motion, when they're feeling tight and you all of a sudden decompress it, then let them just fly with it. Then you can get a really good response and have them feel more confident and comfortable in that movement. And then hopefully load it whatever you need to do, wherever you are in that rehab process or recovery process with somebody, that's how I personally go about cupping, but I'm not really big on the, this color means this, or this amount of bruising means that you have so many toxins in your body that a lot of that, I believe comes from the Chinese medicine side. That's and, more holistic, holistic yeah, beliefs. And there's not real science behind it. It's kind of just but yeah, definitely a much more holistic philosophy for me. Once again, like if there's a reason that we can get some, use something on somebody and it's a modality, it seems like it's in the right time and place. Then that's really how you go about it with high, higher level athletes. You don't get into the nitty gritty of does this work? Does this work? Does this work? You just want to know, okay, if this is what aided them to get to where they need to you just implement that. And a lot of people don't like that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is the, the technical explanation of what patechia is patechia is just superficial bruising blood vessels popping yeah. actually like you can get patechia a lot of people get don't even realize it get patechia when they do really aggressive workouts you ever see like people's like 
um, faces just get really, really red or get like little like speckled dots. It may have happened to you before. I get it a lot when I go heavy with deads or heavy with squats, like my face. Like that's what that is. I get that every single time I've ever drank an alcohol. I don't know if that that's just swell. That's just rosiness and redness. I think that's just fl- like flushing of the of the skin. No, I'm talking like you will I'll actually get like dots and it looks like there were just tiny little pinpricks all over my face because of like so much pressure in my face. Okay. Yeah. That's like a different type of tech. What happens with Graston real Graston is I'd say more aggressive than patechia. Mm-hmm. Like Graston's like true bruising. Like that's just, it's almost the same as what, at least what people are doing with it. I'm not saying that's what it, what Graston is supposed to be. Graston can be implemented and has been implemented in a lot of good ways. Um, but what people have believes and coined what Graston is is that high level bruising and it's just not that's not the case you're straight up just bruising somebody you might as well just be punching them but what is the general concept behind it? people think it's like has something to do with fascia right is that what they usually say yeah they just they say that you can get deeper with certain things and he, once again it goes back to that you really are not going to be able to apply enough pressure to even mold or change fascia in any way there's always like some research and studies that come out where they show pictures of fascia and then they show pictures of it again. And there looks like there's some form of proof. I want to say they're building it a little bit more now where they are trying to get the studies up and going more and more for it. I don't know how confident we could actually say that just yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it comes back to the, the same, there's basically there's the, all the same thing, just different ways yeah, of going about it. And that's like, that's the same that's the philosophy for everything in this whole thing right whether it's like training rehab recovery however you call it however you want to go about it it's like even talking to nick today we were talking about whether it was anything when it comes to bodybuilding um there's just so much out there so much information there's so much variability so much this can work at this time for you and then next year it doesn't work for you this can work for this time for you and then at this point it doesn't work for you like you can go into those arguments all day but it's really what is allowing that athlete to get to where they need to um, from a, from a, if you're really going to converse about it from a modality standpoint, but it's just a toolbox. You have a toolbox of things that you can implement in your way of treatment. And if you feel as if this is the best toolbox or this is the best tool from this toolbox for this person, then you apply that. And if it doesn't work, hopefully you can try something else. If you have the ability to practice that way, some people are so stuck in the ways that they're practiced that they only believe that one tool works. And that's, those are the people that give me red flags. Those are the people that I try to stray away from. You just got to be very open-minded. Go ahead. No, you're good. Uh, you just got to be like super open-minded with things. And that's not to say that you got to believe into certain things and buy into certain things. It's just, you can't go into certain things with just this type of mindset and think like your way is the only way. Sometimes that doesn't even work. A lot of times it doesn't even work and you got to be able to pivot and have different options to pick from. And you can't just always be a modality person. You can't always just be a manual person. Sometimes you have to be a rehab person. And if that's not, yeah, if it's not your cup, if that's why I wanted to build a gym next door and also have the clinical side, um, working with body is awesome and doing the manual therapy side of it it is very very cool but the injury side of things is where i get really excited you know because every injury is so uniquely different with person to person and you can apl- implement these different modalities in different ways there's times and places for it if somebody's fresh off of a muscle tear and it's bruised and swollen like you're not going to be able to get that person to be walking on that muscle or whatever using that muscle immediately after that's where a lot of passive modalities are very helpful and that's when you want to implement the passive stuff and then you implement the passive and start increasing range of motion or decreasing like pain sensations or swelling whatever it may be and then from passive you want to move into the active portion so if you can implement all those together that's how i feel it all should work not so much I'm a manual guy or I'm a manipulation guy or I'm just a full rehab guy. Mm. A lot of people tend to practice successful people and who do it right tend to practice in a very like moderated full way. They apply certain things when they apply them because not so much about evidence, but more so they just from experience, they know this has worked with them and other people before. So we'll go ahead and give it a shot now. And if it doesn't work, you go ahead and move on to the next thing. And if you can't figure it out, you hopefully have the humility to refer to someone who could have the answer yeah 
Yeah. So you say most of these things in the majority of cases is really more so like neurological, neurological, yeah. uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, treatment. I don't know. It's like, basically it's almost like when powerlifters would like take 500 pounds off the rack and then do their actual <laughs> working set with lighter weight. Yeah. You're, you're acclimating your central nervous system to be ready for something else. Yeah. To an extent. 100%. That's not that's a generalized way of putting it once again, but right. each person's coming in for different things. If you're just looking at it from a strictly bodybuilding point of view, if that's just the only angle we're looking at bodybuilding and manual therapy and how they fall together, a lot it's just it's just another recovery modality that you could throw in. It's a supplement essentially because it it is a luxury because if you're not checking off all the other things that are necessary, doing that is pointless. You know, mm-hmm. unless you have a true acute injury that there's something that you're trying to get addressed. That's where it comes in. And a lot of times manual therapy does help people reachieve range of motion post-injury. So yeah. that's why it falls under this, oh, I need to get this done, or I got to get this done, or this feels tight, I got to get this done. But I, I know guys like, and even with my buddy, like they're so good at like active mobility work that it can get you similar results just by going through it actively. But a lot mm-hmm. of people prefer the passive ways of going through it. That's where it kind of falls in, where in bodybuilding a lot, of, they feel as if you can only get there from a passive way yes you can use that as a supplement but actively you can get there and if you're not checking off all the other boxes you shouldn't even be thinking about just getting generalized manual therapy done yeah yeah it just gives you that opportunity to work in and uh i think a lot of thing with bodybuilders is you know you want to spend the time that you're at the gym focusing on bodybuilding like you said you could get you could get a lot of the similar results with active recovery active methods and you know Doing the passive stuff, again, gives you that opportunity to go and go to the gym and, you know, work with better ranges of motion and, you know, maintain that. But if you take something like my chest, this pec is shortened, right? But that's not from, you know, fucking one thing. It's from years of, you know, it's years of doing this, right? So I would go into deep tissue, get this, you know, break all this up or whatever, have this work. And I would feel more mobile after, right? But it never permanently resolve the issue it would snap back so what i always do now and this is what i've done for the past years you know do the pnf style bandit open this up every time and that's giving me more improvements because i'm consistently doing that all the time rather than just relying on this temporary relief that'll you know subside yeah 100 percent, and that's really what it comes down to unfortunately i hate to say it but it's it is convenience like how they manage time and for some people it's just a very therapeutic time period like nick tells me like when he's here it's just a way for him like decompress and when you're at that level you don't want to be stressed out like stress will destroy your whole physique within within a day like you know like you just want to be managing that and people are like no that's an over exaggeration it's no you just don't know what it takes to be a top three olympian in the world like the guy probably has so much like who knows what's going on in his head Mm -hmm. if he can get a moment to turn that off that's probably really really good for him yeah, you always feel better. You sleep, sleep great, sleep great. Yeah, afterwards. I mean, you combine all those things together, and if somebody feels as if they're in a relaxed state and they go home and their whole day is better and they're sleeping better, and all those things compiled together are just better for that athlete, that's a win for me. Mm-hmm. Definitely. All right. Well, I think we covered a good amount here. Is there anything that you want to plug? Anything you want to talk about? No, I was, just, I was just honestly, if you wanted to update me on your whole situation, I didn't know like. Is there anything you're nervous about going into this? Like, did you, like, you've talked, I saw your video that you posted. First of all, it was very well done. So props. Um, what, with was, our, our appointment? Uh, well, no, 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 that was cool. Was that combined? I'm trying to remember. Was that combined? Was that, did you break that one up with how you started it with yourself and you wrote, like, I'm, I'm quitting. Retired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Retired. Yeah. Sorry. There's so many things going through my head. Um, yeah, no, I like the way you did it. I just like the way you went about it. Good clickbait for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was good. But what were you asking if there's anything I'm nervous about? Yeah. Like, is there like people just going into this? I just get curious as to like where people's mindsets are. No, I mean, honestly, I would do it tomorrow if I could. I, it's just the more that I've thought about it and it's just basically, I'm almost like hopeful. Yeah. I hope the surgery works out at this point. Cause it's again, it's just something I've dealt with for eight years. So yeah. the fact that it's this minimally invasive surgery, I don't have to get a whole fucking fusion. It's not going to be something that's going to take me, you know, six months to start recovering. Like by six months, I should be good. Or at least hopefully, uh, you know, I'm willing to sacrifice that time because I'm going to be better. And I just can't even imagine, you know, waking up and not feeling that pain. It would be insane. It would like, I don't even remember what it's like to feel like that. So 
I'm more excited than anything else. I'm really, I'm really not scared. Cause again, I don't feel like there's any crazy risk to it. There's not like I could become paralyzed cause it's a low, it's in my L5, L4, 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 five. It's not like it's all the way fucking up here. So sure. no, I don't think that's something to be concerned about. Dude. If you're, you're going to somebody who's well-respected in that and does that stuff on a daily basis, I'm just excited to see like the direction you go after it and curious to see like where your mind will be. Cause that's a huge thing. Like you said, this is something for eight years. This is not, and we talked about this before. This isn't something that I'm like rushing to see you get into bodybuilding again. Like I just, I'm very curious to see like how it like shifts your mindset because being in pain for that long um, and living with it day to day, you don't even know what that's going to feel like. So when you obviously come to and function, hopefully without pain, it'll be very interesting to see if there's a shift in focus or mindset or anything along those lines. Very easy to talk about it right now, but we won't know until we're there. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing is kind of even more recently, I, everything that I've ever dealt with, like every situation that is objectively like a shitty situation from the outside, you always learn, you always like learn a lot, whether it's fucking something like this, or even if you have enough self-awareness and you're in like a relationship and you fuck up, like you, there's, there's always shit to learn. And throughout yeah. this whole thing, you know, I've learned, even more so the past four or five months a lot more just about mobility work about the spine it's like maybe a lot more knowledgeable just in terms of coaching i get it's it's funny because i see like slight scoliosis in fucking so many people now and they i'll yeah. tell them i'll be like i'll be like shift your hips over you have like so scoliosis like no i don't I'm like i could clearly see it like, but <laughs> it just makes you so much more aware and i just know how to you know help people with injuries to a, a greater extent so i think it, there is a, a silver lining there where you know, there is a lot that has been learned. And also when I go back to bodybuilding, there's going to be a lot more caution with things. Like I'm not, the, the way that I'm going to train is obviously going to be similar in a bodybuilding aspect, but the way that I execute is going to be different to an extent as well. Yeah. No, I think like you, you hit the nail on the head. And we, even the first time we talked, I was like, man, this dude knows so much, has so many questions about this, this, and this, and you don't get that from a lot of people. And then all the stuff that we did cover and talk about, like all the information that you even made me like, spit out i'm like wow like i haven't had to talk about this stuff in this type of depth in a while because most people don't know yeah. when you're coming with something so serious when you're coming with something so i'm not saying severe but an actual issue that's so long term and it's like really getting in, in the way of you being able to do what it is that you want to do and you're so determined like you want to get that answer yeah. and like you said as you come back from it and when you go back to bodybuilding whatever that may be that in itself is going to be such a learning process and you're going to take so much away from it and it's going to be so cool to see how you can potentially implement that in clients in the future and even now you've already, you already are and you, you're noticing things that you never would have noticed before yeah yeah so it's cool you know i am very determined i think i just always want to understand everything because i don't yeah. like i come to you like i said that in the video like i go to you like i go to people and i go to people that are obviously much more educated and i trust them but i like i've always tried to grab information from anybody whether it's anything and like take multiple avenues and do the research, do my due diligence. So I fully understand shit and can, you know, relay that in other circumstances or just have a better understanding of what I'm dealing with rather than just blindly, like trusting you, what you say and tell me what to do, but not even understanding what's going on. Right. Yeah. But not everyone's like that, dude. So many people are like, tell me like, it's, it was so funny when you did question certain things or this or that, like I get taken, I get like, kind of surprised because other people are like looking for me to tell them like this is this that is that because of what they've been so conditioned to do and i leave things up to people when i when, when somebody comes in and they're like so when am i supposed to come back and i'm like you're not yeah. supposed to like if you need something if you need my help with something if something severely happens or goes wrong like that's cool but there's no general guideline for this or that when you hit me with questions of like, all right, so this and this and this, and I'm just like, oh, wow, like this person really wants to know. And like, you're trying to understand, whereas other people just want to be told certain things. So that, and it's, that, that was so different for me. Yeah. Some people get annoyed by it. About what? Like, like me, me asking questions. I remember last year. So let me, had... so let me, okay. So you, that's so funny. You bring that up. Let me ask you that. How do you like, cause I know like you're an anomaly essentially like you what you did is not what most people do most people need to be told by a higher authority or authority i don't know why i said it like that <laughs> um most people want to be told for some reason so when you question it i know that other people who have like a higher authority or profession such as mine whatever you want to call it um they could get flustered like some mm -hmm. a lot of people professionals don't like being questioned because then they have to explain themselves yeah no so when how I had, like, how do you handle that? Have people told you like they don't 
like what's like have they said something i'll just keep pressing them <laughs> they <laughs> i i when i had my growth hormone allergy i told you about this right yeah. allergic to growth hormone so yeah. my fucking i'm getting hives all over my body i'm freaking out the amount of research i had to do to figure this out was insane because there's literally nothing correlating growth hormone use to fucking getting an, an immune a hype a, what is it uh type 3 hypersensitivity immune complex mediation or some shit it's just how the body processes the the, the fucking allergen and i'm like it's because it comes back to the fact that like as a bodybuilder you have all these variables accounted for so eventually yeah. i nailed it down to the fact that it has to be growth hormone like there's no other way it's not the growth hormone and the only way it's going to cure is when the body has enough time to cure out the immune complexes since i took it out for this many weeks it's probably going to take this long for it to clear and i made all these assumptions and i came up with this whole theory and i went to go see an immunologist she's telling me it could be this i'm like no like i i presented her the whole theory and she was just like bamboozled like she didn't know what to say she was like well it could be that and i was like hey, what else could it be and she started to get annoyed and yeah i i was basically trying to get her to say you know because i didn't want to take this medication that medication i just knew that what i was dealing with like there's no other way this could have randomly happened to me it has to go back to this she's like well we don't know that and uh she just got very annoyed because it basically almost sounded like like she's an immunologist, but I was able to explain what was going on better than she could. Than her. And yeah. she was just like, oh, that, that kind of makes sense. And I was fucking right. So- <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, you're, you're hundred percent right. If for an at, from an average person standpoint, you walk into, if you walked into most Kairos, I'm not saying like, I understood it better by any means, or I understood it this way. If you walked into any place realistically with how much information you came with, there's a high chance that you are going to know more hype. Like you were, the research that you did was so hyper specific, right? So for you to be able to put that together, there's a high chance that whatever your issue was, you could have walked into whatever you're going to go into and probably know more because most people aren't going to have that type of knowledge. Yes, they're taught a lot of things in school, but they're just not going to have it. But it is very disappointing to know that you can get, not you specifically, that but that you're able to find out more information than these people that are supposed to be your professionals. Like that happens in a lot of cases and it's kind of a bummer. <laughs> there's no other way to put it. It's such a letdown at times. Yeah, no, I think when you're dealing with anything like specific, you, it's like your obligation to, I just how I see it. it's your obligation to figure shit on your own. Like there's people out there to help you, but ultimately it's your responsibility. It's also something I try to relay because obviously it's not the same, but with the whole fucking crowd of like TikTok and they listen to everything, like it's the Bible and whatever this guy said is optimal. That's the way. And I always try to relate this. It's like, it doesn't matter if I say it or this guy says it or that guy says it, it doesn't matter how knowledgeable they are. Take everything with a grain of salt, listen to it. You know, obviously we've proven ourselves to be trustworthy, but listen to this guy, listen to that guy, take everything, be a fucking just a uh, sponge, absorb everything, do your own due diligence, gain the experience and use critical thinking to understand things in, in a greater perspective and ultimately become smart. You can't just listen to what one person says and think you have the end all be all answer. It's, you know, doing a lot of research, due diligence and going through it yourself. That's how you really fucking learn. But people yeah. don't to do that. No, dude, I think you hit it on the head, like critical thinking and like even experience, like go out there and do it. Like so many of us, when it could like, like training, for example, so many of us just like used to just train. Like we just started it and just like do the most basic stuff. We did bro splits, this, that, just tried it all. And like now like kids want to jump into what is the best for me? And I'm like, yeah. you don't even know, like you don't even know what you like, like, yeah. you know what I mean? And it's, you want to just tie yourself to a philosophy or to a certain thing and you haven't tried anything. I used to watch just YouTube videos and these guys had like the craziest stuff. Like, I don't know about you, but like I did some stupid stuff when I trained early on in like high school. Like I, I did some um, Rich Piana stuff just to try it. Like it was such stupid stuff. And you know what I'm talking about? Now? Like some dumb stuff that Tom Platts used to do. Like you try all these things early on in your career and you're like, well, that sucks. Well, that didn't feel great. You move weights that you're not supposed to try to move. And a lot of that is so much experience, but now it's just like, one, the funds removed from it. I don't even find a lot of it fun because everyone's so technical. Yeah. But it just goes back to all of it, whether it's recovery, rehab, who to see, what kind of professional to go to. Like people would just find one polarized opinion or one polarized thing, and that's all they take from. And you lose out on so much. You yeah. lose out so much potential and education and knowledge. I disagree with a lot of people, but it doesn't mean I can't learn from them. Like yeah. it's just the reality of it. There's small little things that I take from people that I can't stand, but you do take it and you can run with it to a certain extent. But like you said, just be a sponge when it comes to anything in this field, health and fitness, just be a sponge and don't stick to one philosophy. Yeah. And things are going to change for you personally, but like your body is going to change your mental, your health. Everything is going to change over time. So to think that you're going to have the same philosophy that you did when you first started 
to mm -hmm. the middle of your career slash to the end of your career is going to be so different. So there's no reason that your mindset shouldn't be super open. You got to mm -hmm. be able to be willing to learn from people at all different levels and all different age groups and experiences. So that way, when it's time for you to go through certain things, like you've already taken it in. Yeah. Always be a, always be a student. I think that's something you should always give. Always, always be a student no matter what, like even, you know, the level that I'm at, people look to me for information, but I still try to be a student of other, other avenues. And it's just, people become so dogmatic, especially with, you know, the platforms now and how everybody receives this information. It's like this Dunning Kruger effect, but it's like you said, keeping an open mind. I think uh, trading has lost a lot of the fun in it. Everybody wants to be the most optimal way and say, this this split's not good. That split's the bro split sucks. It's like, you've never even done a bro split. You don't even know. Like that could be the most best way for you to trade. You might enjoy uh, dude, it the most. I, first, might... <laughs> I love the bro split. I think about it all the time. I'm like, dude, yeah. that was so simple. Like yeah. I wish I could just go back to trading like that again. And I'm like, it was, you knew exactly what day was what. And it just made life easy and everything was so regulated. Yeah. It's Machines. Just, <laughs> yeah and that's what i'm saying like it's just it's i don't know things are so different now i don't know why people don't want to take that risk and spend the time to just enjoy the process and just try things out people don't look at training like that anymore there's the, just too many too much optimization going on lately and the difference that it makes is so so negligible it's like not even only do machines i can bro the, the machines feels like shit why do i want to do this machine oh it's but more stability feels like shit yeah. i can't even feel my chest <laughs> it's better more stability it's too <laughs> People have complicated, I think what the platforms have done is made everybody think that they just work with the highest level. And it's like the information that you're putting out, especially for general population, is so basic. You just mm -hmm. the general population needs the most basic thing in the world. And they're going to see results if there's any level of consistency. And why people overcomplicate it is beyond me. I mean, it's a great marketing thing, but it's this is something I'm curious to see what you'll say on this. But this is something that I've started to think now is that I used to hate like the concept of cookie cutter and basic generalized programs the more and more when i was coming up and i was like this is awful and the more and more i'm working with the general population and the real world you're just like wow like individuality really only matters for a very small percentage of people and like generalization actually is going to be much better for the popula population than people even realize and it's just so weird to think that I'm even thinking that way because people are going to hate on it so much. But the reality is when the information that you're putting out onto the internet is just going out to the whole world, most people sitting on their couch are not going to be high level athletes. They're just people looking to improve their health mm -hmm. and any form of consistency for whatever it may be is going to be more beneficial for their health rather than worrying about like optimizing every little thing. That stuff matters for such small people because you're only talking about one percent of the world that it's only going to factor into yeah and, you know it's just such a weird it's a, it's so weird that like, i feel this way now because i never would have thought that i would have felt this way before like being in the position that i'm in at times and working with the people that i work with i realize how much individuality like really matters at a small scale mm -hmm. yeah definitely i think with a lot of the information being put out there it's the creator's job to disclose the context that they're talking with them but also at the same time i understand why a lot of guys don't because it's polarizing and it's a great fucking marketing tactic to just say that you should only do this instead of that and try to make a short tiktok that's just fucking clickbaiting and now everybody thinks you got to do it this way because he said it but it's also your job as the consumer to have fucking critical thinking and like think into what you're consuming and realize is it actually that deep or is he speaking within a specific context and how can i apply that to my training without it being this overcomplicated thing where now if I see somebody doing external rotation before their workout, I'm not going to say that they're producing too much fatigue that's going to affect their fucking pressing. You know, it's just- Yeah, that, it, that stuff is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's if insane. that's really what you're worrying about, like, you know, like if that's what's keeping you from becoming the next Mr. Olympia, then by all means, external rotate all you want. But it's, it's not going to, you know, it's like little nuances, just stop doing that stuff. Just meat and yeah. potatoes for now, meat and potatoes for the early bit of your career. If you can't, if you can't build a great chest with a dumbo press and you're not going to fucking be Mr. Olympia by doing a machine, like that's not going to be the end all difference. It's really not. Yeah. And there's so, there's such a level of skill that people are now missing. Like, why can't we treat, if you want bodybuilding to be respected as a sport, you have to respect the aspects of what come with the sport and skill is such a big portion, but people just think that 
I'm on this machine. I got this weight. I moved it from point A to point B. And I know everyone has said this before, but you like, just because you're good at contracting, cool. You can get a good contraction one day and not a good contraction the other day. Like you need to really work on that skill. It has to be a skill to be able to like achieve certain levels of stimulus. If you're not hitting that every single time, you're not good at what you do. Like your skill level is not good. Some people can get to a certain high level because genetically they're very gifted and it was able to happen, but you see where skills becomes a separation. You just somebody's ability to be so good at moving weight in such a good way. I mean, I, I love Nick as an example. He just yeah. does it at, at a crazy, crazy level. You got to treat, if you can get 10 years of lifting under your belt, it's 10 years of skill that you should be amazing at by the time you're, you know, peaking for the prime of your career, whatever it may be, it should be something that needs to be constantly improved. And people think just because, just because you can sit down and pull a lap, pull down, down 10 times does not mean you're good at it. Yeah, you no, know, I, this is do with ease. I, I emphasize that a lot. Phil, I know Phil's emphasized that a lot. Training is a skill. And a lot of people don't look at it that way. They just think, oh, I'm just, it's an accessory. I'm just going to the gym, working out. Like it's this basic, simple thing. And they see every other sport as skill. And it's, it's unfortunate because it is a skill and it does get developed. And this is what I do with all my clients. And I make them send me, I don't make them, but I tell them like, I want you to send me form evaluation videos every time you do check-ins. Because even though you might think you're doing something correctly, your form might look fine. There's 99% of the time something can improve in some aspect. And I want us to be making the most and improving that skill. And a lot of guys just think they have it nailed down and this is also why i'm not against machines but i also advocate for using all the tools in the toolbox developing better stability you know if you could have better control with your chest when there's less stability provided you're probably going to develop a better chest compared to if you only can rely on things where there's the most stability uh provided rather than if you could be in this challenging environment and then also the whole aspect of longevity which you know is like one of the biggest aspects of longevity and be able to be a functional human when you're older is also the stability that you're provided, being able to do hinges, you know, unilateral stuff. It's all going to carry over. And I think a lot of people just look at it from this like exercise science kind of meathead mentality to an extent where it's like, just build muscle, just provide the most stability so that the muscle can work the hardest. It's like, you want to challenge the body in all these different aspects so that you could become a better athlete, not just a fucking building muscle. You know, it goes hand in hand. Yeah, I think I saw videos recently of Bumstead, or well, probably well, at least a couple months old now, working with a guy named Vernon Griffith. And Vernon's very well known in the sports world, uh, especially the athletic world, for working on movements uh, and just being a really smart individual in the sports world. I believe he's a trainer um, and has very good qualifications. But he was working with Bumstead and they were working on just so much rotation. And mm -hmm. you could see, like, one, we all know Bumstead's gone through quite a bit of injuries now so he has to address those things and he also wants to address life after bodybuilding so he's starting to work on those things now i'm sure he now wishes he had started addressing those things a longer time ago but you see people always starting to address things once they become a problem you could i don't want to say we can prevent anything but we can definitely be more productive towards life after certain things and we can be more productive in just developing as a better athlete and it can have a crossover to developing that skill of being a better possible bodybuilder i mean it's not guaranteed it's not always necessarily just black and white but it's hard to believe that working on certain things in that manner aren't going to be beneficial mm -hmm. and people just get very caught up in literature and uh, they want to avoid things because they think it's going to be counterproductive when it's not counterproductive it's going to help it might not be on paper as good as doing a leg press compared to doing a lunge, right? You know, the muscle is going to be under able to produce more force when there's more stability provided, but you're still going to fucking build your quads when yeah. you're doing lunges. And you're also going to build more stability, which is going to help you in a long, in the long, long run longevity, being able to walk around. You don't want to end up like Ronnie. You want to fucking be like Jay and able to run, all, walk around fine without problems. And that's going to, you know, reduce that risk highly. And I have all my guys practice this stuff. They'll be like, I don't want to do lunges. It's too hard. I'm like, you can't even do the lunge without falling over. So until you could do lunges without falling over, then we're going to keep them in. You know, it doesn't have to be yeah. in there forever, but you should know how to do these effectively. And sometimes, like like you said, this will be one of the last things I say. Um, but sometimes, um, like if somebody like can't do simple co coordinated movements like that, maybe there's a, more of an underlying problem, like neurologically that you may have just accidentally found, you know, I'm not saying it's going to be the case very commonly, but who knows, you could potentially find something and going back to what you just said about Ronnie, Ronnie couldn't do good movements after 
I his surgery was botched, not because he <laughs> practiced certain things, but once his surgery was downhill, then it was just he he had a he had a bad path coming, but it wasn't like it wasn't just necessarily like not doing certain things. Yeah, no, I don't know, but I would, people, I would, that's my opinion. That's for the people for the people out there. They're gonna hear that. I want. I would like to see. I I sure there's like nothing out there that can actually you know show this yet, but like what an 80 year old guy looks like after 40 years of only ever using machines to lift versus some guy who did more dynamic movements, barbell squats, lunges, all that stuff involved in there. And what the difference would be when they're 80 years old. Cause I feel like there would be a difference. I think the closest we'll get is probably like somebody like Dexter Jackson, maybe if we see him like down the line, but even with that being said, I, there's just so much variability. There's so much genetic component of it that just uh -huh. saying, just using the variables, this guy used machines, this guy used free weights is crazy. Cause yeah. in theory, like the guy, like hypothetically, the guy who just used free weights could have such good genes that his joint health, muscle health, everything looks phenomenal. And the guy who just used machines had horrible card of genetics could end up having the most like arthritic looking body in the world. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's that aspect of it too. I get yeah. where you're going with it. I would yeah. love to know it, but you'd have to get that study done across such a large, vast population to yeah. even be remotely considerable. Of course, you can use evidence and try this and that, but I don't know if you're going to get anything guaranteed. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I think I think either way, <laughs> use all the tools in the toolbox. Better to be safe than sorry. Become proficient in all areas. Become a better overall athlete. Have more skills, and it, it looks cooler. <laughs> yeah, if you want to be called an athlete, you got to act like one. Yeah. Just everybody picks up shit and puts it down. Yeah, it's not a, it's not that crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's simple, you know. But that's just that's the way I look at it. Yeah. That, all right. We're uh, we're running on two hours here. All right. I know, dude. This is crazy. I did not think I was going to go this long. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's uh let's end it here, everybody. Doctor Umar, you wanna do you wanna plug your place or no? Sure. Yeah. I'm located in Voorhees, New Jersey at uh, uh, Asylum Sports Performance and Recovery. The Instagram is the Asylum Sports Clinic. If you ever have a question or need anything, you can just reach out to me on Instagram. I'll get back to you. All right. Well, there you go. Thanks check for having out. Me, Yeah. If you're in the area, go check him out. Thanks for coming on. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode of Brass Tech Bodybuilding.